Hello and welcome to Atop the Fourth Wall, where bad comics burn. You know, sometimes it's hard to come up with clips to describe a year. I wonder if there was something appropriate for my show this year that also kind of describes 2022. Yeah, 2022 has been a year of successes and setbacks, of things that make us ready to take on the future, and things that make the future kick us while we're down. I would not call it a bad year, at least compared to 2020 or 2016, but I think that's because we're only now starting to recover a bit, get our footing back after getting knocked down a few times. But it feels like it's harder than it should be. You can see that in politics, certainly, but on a more micro level, you can see that with me, the guy who built a reputation of consistently releasing weekly episodes, having to continually cancel, reorder, or outright skip an entire month of reviews in the vain hope of getting back on schedule as happened in November with no Secret Origins month. It's probably just a matter of me getting older. I'm in my mid-30s. I don't have the energy and drive of these young whippersnapper YouTubers who could talk about shoelaces for six hours and still be shockingly gripping and entertaining the whole way through. Still, if you have less patience and just want me to get to the actual list of this year, this video is divided into the 2022 recap and the list portion. Click on the chapter division accordingly. Otherwise, yeah, 2022, especially the autumn, has been a rough year for me, but not an unproductive one. Since I mentioned the autumn and had that clip from Ross, and Halloween saw us taking our second year look at the Ring franchise, exploring the bizarre and terrible original sequel to the story, as well as an adaptation of short stories related to it. Surprisingly, the one that had a random umbilical cord and a secret altar is the less awful of these works. Easily so, considering Ross, and, aka Spiral says that you can mutate people's DNA with videotapes, so it's gonna be uphill after that. Unfortunately, those reviews also featured the return of the Mirror Universe Margaret, and she kicked my ass something fierce. Only saved by friggin' Moarte. I'm sure that won't come back to bite me in the ass or anything. On that note, 2022 was the 10th anniversary of Longbox of the Damned, and people got to learn how I met that asshole. And also maybe how he got started. I heard somebody told campfire stories about that. But hey, speaking of non-comic book review stuff that happened on the show, we finally advanced the contest of champions, right? Let's show Show some clips! Don't worry, I'm sure that things will be over in the next month. Without you guys seeing the race, because they won't give me the footage of it. It'll be in the compilation. Anywho, back to comic stuff! Two years ago, it was the year of crossovers. Last year was the year of Batman. So appropriately, this was the year of Superman, with a lot of material concerning the last son of Krypton. We had a Patreon-sponsored review of the Superboy series. The 700th episode was Frank Miller's quick nosedive of the miniseries Superman Year One, which started out decently and then fell to the ground wily e. Coyote style. His two major appearances in Event Comics Month, the annual DC Challenge review, and a Patreon-sponsored review of the film Man of Steel. And that review is actually part of a trilogy of reviews this year. I call it the Content ID Hates Me Trio. In the case of Man of Steel, it would appear that while everywhere else I can get away with seven seconds of footage at a time, when it comes to Warner Brothers, they apparently have a looser five or six seconds, leaning on the former. I spent the better part of two days trying to get that damn review up. And in fairness, it worked exactly like how Content ID should work. It detected a problem right after upload, so it gave me a chance to delete it and try again once I had corrected the issue without it going public first. Problem is, it took like 40 minutes to an hour to render each version, and another 10 to 15 minutes to re-upload it, so again and again and again it kept finding new problems, but oh, wait, it detected the same segment again after I'd already edited it! The solution was to make the damn video spin. That's what I had to do to get the review of that miserable film uploaded. And the hilarious part is... I didn't have any problems with the Batman v Superman review from the year before. It's only Man of Steel that had this issue. Why'd you say Martha? That's fine. Complaining about CGI sand? How dare I? 
But like I said, a trio of videos with this issue. Another Patreon-sponsored review had me look at the Killing Joke animated adaptation. Now this one got claimed after it had already been up for a bit, and sometimes I just don't want to try to appeal because it lasts a while and there's no guarantee it'll go through, so I tend to just re-upload it, and in fairness, that one content ID detected footage from two separate scenes that looked similar enough next to each other, so easy mistake for it to make. But then it found a few more issues and I had to re-upload it like three times. That one eventually was fine, but then there was the Legopolis review! This year I decided to try a little experiment, a Patreon-sponsored poll for a Doctor Who episode review so I could do a review outside of comics. Something fun to talk about that I had plenty of opinions to share. The BBC had objections to this idea. Like the Killing Joke review, they claimed it a few days after each re-upload attempt. Even getting worse when they actually claimed footage of me, too! And even that was not enough for them. Finally for that one, I did just plead and go through the full appeals system, writing a letter begging them to just let me have the damn video, and that it was a positive review, and the visuals are so damn short. And it finally worked, but I think that was four re-uploads. Despite that whole fiasco, I do plan on doing another poll like that next year, since again, we're skipping Secret Origins Month in 2023, because it'll be Doctor Who's 60th anniversary, and we're gonna celebrate that! At least they won't claim reviews of comics. I hope. This year, with movies and games and TV shows all about multiverses and alternate timelines and asking, hey, what if this happened instead? It's not surprising that we had a couple Patreon-sponsored reviews exploring alternate possibilities in popular stories. The first was an exploration of Star Wars, where Luke failed to destroy the Death Star. The end result was Yoda committing genocide! You know, maybe people had a point when they said the prequels were showing the Jedi being assholes. The other explored what would have happened if Optimus Prime had lived in Transformers the movie. The end result there was the universe taking a big crap on the season 3 cast of the show, killing them or making them jerks. But don't worry guys, your sacrifice was necessary for... The events of the movie to be largely unchanged. Optimus' presence made little difference. Patreon also saw us do two more X-Men reviews, and weird ones at that. We had X-Men Green, a terrible Webtoon-style free digital comic that showed the character Nature Girl become an environmental terrorist in a story that didn't seem to know if he were supposed to be agreeing with her wanton murder and aggression, and the other being a novel of all things to complete another trilogy, the Star Trek and X-Men crossovers. Planet X was the first time I had ever tried to review a proper text-only book. I think the experiment worked out and we learned that Storm and Captain Picard have the hots for each other. Also, Dom showed up. Wow, what a weird waste of a cameo. On that note, I got to do a few collaborations and cameos with my fellow internet people. That cameo with Dom was one of two times we were together, as we also got to read a couple chapters of a dirty novel for charity. A bad one at that. It's music to my dick. Oh, that hurt me. She's exquisite, even in SpongeBob pajama trousers! Yes! Like a poor marksman, you keep missing the target. <laughs> I skim my lips down her throat to her gold cross. I twirl it with my tongue, enjoying the day. Don't lick Jesus, you sick fuck! Just have sex already! This is just giving you guys the idea that patrons should request I review Harlequin romances, isn't it? It took me a while, but I was finally able to get into Takahata 101's bar and have my VTuber debut! Unfortunately, I get the feeling that he didn't really appreciate me talking about the Ring novels. And then it infected Sadako, and yeah, somehow her psychic yeah. powers altered the videotape so the videotape would alter your DNA. And clearly I am a VTuber now, since only VTubers can enter that bar! Behold my hyper-realistic model! I am the king of VTubing! After that clip, physical laws broke down and the universe almost collapsed because apparently three-dimensional beings can't exist in a two-dimensional one. Still the king of VTubing. Also, I had the supreme honor of probably being the closest to doing something officially with Mystery Science Theater 3000 that I'll ever get, playing Riff Tracks the Game on their Twitch channel alongside Mars Girl and Little Karibo. I'm telling you, they're monsters! I didn't know I wanted a Clifford zombie movie, but here we are. <laughs> <laughs> we 
had some endings in the reviews. The final part of Youngblood Strike Files opening storylines. They were bad. A detail I'm sure you're all surprised about. As well as the final issue of Ultimate Power. It was also bad. You guys just have to decide which one was worse. Other Patreon-sponsored reviews were all over the place, from a few issues of an image series that featured an uber-powerful chicken, to a Sonic miniseries about some popular side characters, to another long review of a somewhat maligned storyline, Maximum Carnage in this case. We are slowly whittling down that top 15 comics I won't review list. Maybe I'll do an update of that for a future end-of-year video. On the subject of Sonic, we looked at Ken Penders' failed attempt to create his own original series with The Lost Ones, the premiere of the post-Zero Hour Legion of Superheroes, and some more episodes of Go Kyger as we explored the Sixth Ranger a bit more. We had the penultimate reviews for US-1 and the Star Wars, more of Godzilla Kingdom of Monsters, just imagine Stan Lee creating the DC Universe, and the aforementioned DC Challenge. And we got to have our first Stargate review! The giant floating head of General Hammond will return! No, well, probably not, but I'll probably do some more Stargate reviews in the future at least. We got to have Event Comics Month 4, Secret Metal Armageddon 2, and see the various ways Event Comics can really, really suck! And one that most people like, but I'm just kinda meh about. However, more important than any huge company-wide crossover Event Comic, we looked at three Mr. T-related materials! We had Mr. T Serial, we had the T-Force, and we had him trying to teach Webster the true meaning of Christmas, while Campbell Soup tried to convince us that soup was good food. There's just more soup! Watch last week's episode, people. It was a fun one and a good place to end Christmas on. Did you get what you wanted for Christmas this year? I did! I got an Earthshock-era Cyberman gun! <laughs> Oh, on April Fool's Day, the channel might have premiered a full analog horror movie called Winter of 83, and the DVD for that is coming soon with additional segments, plus creator commentary, and you should either check out the movie or buy the DVD, hint hint, wink wink, nudge nudge. It has been an eclectic year, to say the least. So what better time, then, to look back at this show's history and examine the 15 weirdest and goofiest superheroes that I have ever had to share with you all. From PSAs, to advertisements, to downright officially licensed and integrated parts of their comic universes, sometimes superheroes are just... ridiculous. I mean, for an ad, it's more a joke than anything else, even if it is silly. But you'd expect better of the companies whose entire bread and butter is superheroes. You just stop and wonder what the hell they were thinking. Still, with those ads and PSAs and whatnot, just because they're not intended to be taken that seriously, it doesn't make them any less laughable. And we've seen quite a few on this show. So let's dig into the top 15 weirdest and goofiest superheroes of Atop the Fourth Wall and end 2022 on something fun. Number 15, Captain Electron. Captain Electron makes the first of the list mostly because, by design, he's more of a traditional superhero. It's a generic superhero, certainly, but a traditional one nevertheless. Created to promote the Brick Computer Science Institute, an organization rivaled only by Trump University and ITT Technical Institute for how much of a scam it was, and showed off the amazing power of computers to... track plutonium and for modems to do things they shouldn't be able to. But even for a generic superhero, there's some goofiness to him. His symbol basically just being the flashes, his cape that's choking him on the cover, as evidenced by his eyes looking off in two different directions, and that his power set is... vague at best in regards to what it has to do with electrons. But hey, at least he was a new hero for the 1980s, while everyone in the comic dressed and talked like it was the 50s. It's just so bizarre that this was the promotional tool that they used to try to get people into this place all about cutting-edge computer stuff. Because it's so mired in the past, Hell, this was also the book that gave us Mr. Computer lecturing us about the history of computers, so it really was stuck in the past! Now, you may be wondering why Mr. Computer isn't on this list in place of Captain Electron. Well, that's easy! This is a list for heroes, not villainous monsters. Number 14, The Fixer. Ah, this noble soul, this champion of justice, this 
racist piece of crap Batman ripoff because DC wouldn't publish Frank Miller's hateful diatribe against brown people who followed a religion he didn't like. But believe it or not, it is not the fact that the fixer from Frank Miller's Holy Terror is a bigoted, torturing, awful sack of garbage that puts him on this list. Because this is a list about weird and goofy superheroes. So why is he here then? Because for such a high-profile book, one that was supposed to feature Batman, for the only work that actually features this character, the one Frank expected us to get behind and root for, convinced of the righteousness of his cause, the Fixer is nothing. We joke about Batman and his propensity for theming every object in his arsenal around bats, his detective skills, his super genius planning, his incredible wealth, but the Fixer? There is nothing to him. We don't know his real name, he possesses no backstory, even he admits he has no backstory or general motivation. His costume is just a generic ugly brown base suit for a superhero. He has no symbol, no theming, no superpowers, no particular unique skill set or abilities. We don't even know why the hell he's called the Fixer. It's like a handyman decided to become a superhero, but he thought the plumber or the electrician would be undignified names, so he panicked. In over 100 badly drawn pages, Frank couldn't get around to devoting any story time to who this guy is or why, despite having access to military-grade equipment and contacts with former Mossad agents. His outfit feels like a bunch of tattered rags he found in a garbage can that he duct-taped together into a superhero costume. Hell, the actual character Ragman, whose outfit is made up of rags, looks better than this. The Fixer. The name for a guy who keeps breaking things in the story. Number 13, Mr. Action. A lot of you probably don't even remember this, both because it was so long ago, but also because it was barely a thing when it actually happened. But that's why it's at this part of the list. Mr. Action comes to us from Countdown. One of the many lame subplots of that year-long great disaster had Jimmy Olsen suddenly developing superpowers, which were nods to old Silver Age stories where Jimmy got superpowers for any number of reasons, probably involving aliens, magic, or dreams that Super Baby was having because the Silver Age was kind of weird. And as he was developing these powers, he figured he should try his hand at being a superhero. Hence, Mr. Action. It lasted like two issues, but most of it actually got a little bit of promotion and push from DC. Maybe it was just meant to be in on the joke, but it was such a complete nothing that you really have to wonder why they even bothered. And that's what makes it silly enough to make this list. Just why? If you weren't going to do anything with it, if it was just a silly joke for a cover, why did you put in any effort on it whatsoever? And if it wasn't worth that much effort, why did you do it at all? Mr. Action. Representing Countdown very well. Superfluous, forgotten, and we wish it hadn't happened. Number 12. Sultry Teenage Super Foxes. Incredible that two issues of a terrible indie book had more going on than Mr. Action, but that just means we grew up to see how lame they were for longer. The weirdness is, of course, mostly in the name. Said name only ever being a thing for the title, and yet that's what made it so memorable and bad because the actual superhero aspect of them is pretty pathetic. Four teenage girls who live on an Air Force base decide to use an alchemy machine that can turn dog poop into gold to change themselves into superheroes. And their motivation for spitting in the face of nature, manipulating their genetic code to potentially become Cronenbergian horrors of misshapen flesh and sinew? Eh, it'll impress some boys. And it's really no surprise that when their only motivating factor for getting superpowers is those guys are hot, that their outfits are swimsuits and boob holes. And you'd think that when a book like this exists more to attract prurient interest as it is, that they just go whole hog and make it porn, but nope, we are still intended to take this group seriously. As while there is humor in it, it's more just on the level of the aforementioned golden poop. I'd say that describes this comic and these heroes pretty accurately, but I don't want you to think any part of this is gold. And I'm not even bothering to name them either. Like, would it actually help if I told you their names were Gaia, Astro Gal, Repella, and Firemane? No, it wouldn't, because I made those names up. I don't remember their names either, and they should be left forgotten. Number 11, Wild Thing. 
If Captain Electron exemplified outdated superhero designs and art, then Wild Thing exemplified 90s superhero design and art at its most overdone and overboring. Part of the loosely connected Marvel 2020 line from the UK division, Wild Thing was Nikki Doyle, a virtual reality black marketeer. Yeah, man, I got that copy of Virtual Boy Wario Land for the right price who apparently developed the superpower of jumping into any VR game in use and interact with it. Wild Thing jumping into Half-Life Alex to beat up the G-Man. I mean, points to the comic for actually predicting that by the 2020s we'd still be doing virtual reality stuff. Less so that they assume we're basically, like, plugged into the Matrix for it. Instead of wearing big screens on our faces and wavering around little controllers and pretending to be snurfs in VR chat or something. Like, some of the sci-fi concepts of Wild Thing had some merit, but certainly not. Let's make an entire superhero based on this, and when she goes into VR, she decides to wear an ugly white maroon leotard and also a big patch on her boob for some reason. Her design was awful, and what's more, in the issue we reviewed, her power wasn't really a power so much as a thing that anybody can do because she still had to use virtual reality equipment to do it. But hey, to top off her hideous costume, she at least had a scouter from Dragon Ball Z along with the rest. Which, come to think of it, makes no sense because she already has a thing over her real eyes, so why would she need that as part of her ensemble instead of just a normal HUD? Number 10, Night Cat. Singing superheroes are a bad idea. At least when the medium you introduce them in is one that doesn't utilize sound. But of course, that doesn't stop Night Cat, Marvel's belated attempt to create their own punk pop superheroine. Dazzler, but not also disco, if you will. And it was a resounding failure, despite the fact that unlike other attempts at this concept, they actually did produce an album of songs for the character. It's pretty bland. But there's just so much coming together to make Nightcat a bizarre little gem. Premiering in 1991, during a time period where this sort of gimmick was not going to be as popular as the over-muscled, gun-toting, hyper-violence stuff, getting Stan Lee to write it during a time when he had long since stopped writing regular comic books, and of course just having a story that was rather over-the-top with a father blaming music as the reason Nightcat's mother died, and thus forcing her to take on a secret identity that's just a headband to escape said father's disapproval. Also, the cat at Ilac. Also, also, her origin story basically involves some random rich asshole deciding to take one of her singers under her employ and inject her with animal DNA. For reasons. Why? Because it's science, that's why. Ah, well. Night Cat, at least you gave us the ninja style dancer. Another ridiculous part of the superheroine story. Go ninja, go ninja, go! Go ninja, go ninja, go! Number 9. Neutro. Man, a lot of this list is just really old episodes, isn't it? Anyway, Neutro. Some of you are already going, Neutro, he's not a superhero, he's a giant robot. And you are correct in that regard. But he is most certainly a superhero right from his cover. The most astounding superhero of all! But of course, what makes him so goofy and weird is the other bit of text on the cover. Neutro does not know the difference between right and wrong. Neutro works for Activision. Now, as a sci-fi premise, Neutro actually kind of works. An alien Trojan horse that a species is supposed to construct, but then end up being their undoing and conquest. The problem is, the cover that positions him as a superhero while destroying a city and not knowing good from evil. The sheer range of stuff Neutro's able to do, ride whales, wrestle lions, survive atomic bombs, is already pretty astounding. But then you add on that little detail of his lack of ethical programming, meaning anyone who controls Neutro can do whatever the hell they want with him, just make him kind of ridiculous. And the narration just keeps piling on how silly this is with more and more exaggerated boasting of Neutro and how astounding a superhero he is, assuming he ever gets around to doing anything heroic, because he's just at the whims of whoever has a strong enough transmitter. Still, Neutro, nothing will ever be quite as awesome as you riding that whale. And if that isn't weird or ludicrous enough for this list, I don't know what is. Number 8. Johnny Turbo. We've been 
been subjected to several characters who exist purely for marketing, and we are not done with them by far, but this one's just one of the most baffling we've encountered. Johnny Turbo was a last-ditch effort to try to promote the Turbo Duo console, appearing in a few ads for Electronic Gaming Monthly. He was apparently physically based off the real-life person who was the brand manager of the Turbo Graphics 16 and Turbo Duo, John C. Brandstetter. What's more, these actual magazine ads for a failing console may have been made to make fun of him. Which... Yeah, I can see that. Johnny Turbo's only goal is to tell people about how the Sega CD sucks, because the Turbo Duo came out first. That's really his only selling point for it. I mean, sure, they say the games they have for the Turbo Duo are more intense, but then again, the Sega CD wasn't exactly wowing people that much anyway. Although the fake version of them in the Johnny Turbo comics, called Faka, also sells their version on the street and gives away a bunch of free CD games, which is honestly kind of a steal. The comics frame this as an insidious plot because, GASP! The Sega CD is an add-on instead of a standalone console! Except... You know, a lot of people already had a Sega Genesis, and this was near the end of the Genesis's lifespan, so it was cheaper than it was when it first came out. But we're not here to talk about the console wars, we're here to talk about Johnny Turbo himself, whose powers were... Nothing! I guess he had a gun and knew how to punch people, but that's pretty much it. No, wait, he can appear in his roommate's dreams. And that's where the ridiculousness of Johnny Turbo really shines most of all. Two comics about an evil Sega stand-in give way to a story wherein Johnny Turbo is trying to convince his roommate, who already owns, or at least has access to, a Turbo Duo, how cool the Turbo Duo is through surreal imagery and... Like, maybe this is his superpower, going into people's dreams to get people to buy this thing. Wait, no, that can't be it, because then the Turbo Duo might have actually been successful. Surprisingly, Johnny Turbo got a semi-revival in actual gaming, branding on a series of Switch titles called Johnny Turbo's Arcade, featuring a bunch of retro-style games, as well as Johnny himself appearing in the puzzle battler Crystal Crisis. I salute you, Johnny! The Turbo Duo may be gone, but you're probably still haunting someone's dreams decades later. Number 7. Captain Tax Time Taxes are an essential part of society, providing funding for services that we kind of use for, hopefully, the betterment of said society. Now, of course, people have legitimate concerns about how taxes are used and who should be taxed more than everybody else, but perhaps it's a bad idea to depict those who would be taxing you as literal monsters. I mean, some people in the government are monsters. I'm the government, I'm the government, I'm the reason nothing works clip. But I mean, like... They're not orcs like in this comic. Captain Tax Time, who possesses no civilian identity and wearing a costume that looks like he took an old quilt and upholstered it to a better costume, has a brilliant plan to stop the greedy Canadian government from adding attacks, taking out organized crime, and using their money to pay for the greedy raises the government wants. Which, especially now that I think about it, they defeated the villains by giving them exactly what they wanted. More money. Our hero, everybody! And naturally, Captain Tax Time has tax-based powers like... Thermal Radium Blasts. Why is this guy's only priority taxes? He even has a sidekick who just wants to kill things and has to be held in check by the good captain. Captain Tax Time teased the second issue, but I don't think it ever came about. Instead, we must be satisfied with this defender of not paying new taxes. I mean, he at least took down some drug lords, but if this comic was realistic, chances are the government would take the 30 billion and still go through with the tax, because greedy assholes are kind of not appeased by more money. After all, if they were satisfied with the large amount of money they had, they wouldn't be trying to take more of it, now would they? Number six. Future Five. Oh, Future Five, you condescending jackasses. You end up on these lists quite a bit, don't you? 
and for what is essentially just a PSA comic encouraging kids to go to college. But even I, as someone else who does encourage people to go to college to gain both educational and life skills, would not take the advice of Future Five, who think that college is the only path to success, the only way to achieve your dreams, and kind of ignored the people who were successful but didn't graduate or never went to college at all. Although, to be fair, with the benefit of age and hindsight, I know that some of those people who were successful were already rich and successful thanks to their families. But then again, college can often only be affordable to the already rich unless you just want to be in debt forever. What were we talking about? All oh, right, superheroes who think that fast food workers deserve scorn and shame. I would have liked to see what other missions Future 5 gets up to when they're not dealing with one idiot whose evil scheme is just I want to be smarter than everybody else and will have people go to middle schools to tell kids not to go to college. The chef is especially loathsome as aside from him being the most jerky when it comes to people working in quote unquote lesser food service industry jobs, what he brings to the team is a special blend of herbal tea. This is alongside a woman who was threatening to use a snake to choke a guy to death, just for contrast. Future 5 was one of the first times they ever used Gordon Ramsay clips, and his insults still can apply to this ridiculous team this many years later. But don't start getting fucking smarmy with me when we're standing there in the shit! Future 5. The extent of your power is tea and ready-made infographic signs lecturing people to go to college. And yet somehow you won the day. Get out! You fucking disgrace! Number 5. US 1. While some on this list I may hate, I may despise because of their attitude, because of their nature as propaganda, because of their bigotry, any number of reasons, I can never hate US 1. This toy tie-in comic has had a legacy that has kept Ulysses Solomon Archer alive in the Marvel Universe precisely because it embodies something that I think mainstream superhero comics have moved away from. High concept ridiculousness. Sure, the idea of a trucker superhero is not the silliest hero on this list, but its concept is played with earnestness while still recognizing how completely off the wall all this stuff is. A remote control for a souped up big rig stored in a silver dollar, aliens, supervillains who pilot blimps or have mind control whips. It's the fun kind of superhero stuff that you don't see a lot of modern comics doing these days. Now don't get me wrong, I'm not making some big call to return to the good old days or something like that. Tastes and genres and writing and even entire mediums change and evolve, and being different doesn't mean it's bad. I just think that sometimes it'd be nice to have a bunch of truckers beat up Nazis. US 1 exemplifies how diverse and silly superhero comics can be. Science fiction, fantasy, adventure, trucking, and yet still have a bunch of likable, unique characters who remain memorable this many years later. I wrote years ago in reference to comic book fans, our lot loves the lavishly ludicrous, and US 1 certainly is some of the most lavishly ludicrous stuff I've read on this show. We'll of course still follow Ulysses' adventures after his main series, but damn if I won't miss that series when we're done with it. Number 4. NFL Super Pro Conversely, NFL Super Pro is a tie-in book that really ought to take itself much less seriously than it does. While US1 settled into playing with amusing concepts that could be serious, but were more just amusing, NFL Super Pro treated itself like a legit new superhero book, while the main character was running around in an indestructible football suit with the NFL's logo on it. He gained super strength from chemicals, while also decrying steroid use that turned football players into monsters. Yet it's all played so straight without a single tongue-in-cheek element about it. Him and Spider-Man almost team up, and you can almost feel the angst and pathos of that hero leaking into the book, even though the two never actually meet in the story. NFL Super Pro is not the worst, and I don't hate it. You could probably argue that a football-themed superhero is really no less absurd than a guy with spider powers, Yet something about it just makes it the stuff of parody played completely seriously. But at the same time, the fact that they play it so completely seriously is what makes it so goofy and weird. It feels like this book should have ended after only a few issues, if even that long. But it didn't, lasting just as long as US 1, 
but being sillier than it by virtue of not pointing out it was silly. Number three. Kickers Incorporated. So how do you take NFL Super Pro and make it even more absurd? How about an entire team of football player superheroes? And even better, let's make it one of the launch titles of our brand new imprint that's specifically marketed as being more grounded in the real world. Still, it seems to have a little more self-awareness than NFL Super Pro. Sure, there's melodrama like Super Pro had, but more just as part of the interpersonal relationships of the characters, which should still be serious even if the the plots aren't. But at the same time, for a new universe that was marketed as the world outside your window, nothing quite says grounded realism like the A-team but football players. Also, not the full football team, just one dude's closest friends. That detail of the supposed seriousness of the new universe is what edges it out over Super Pro. Even though Super Pro has the additional detail of everyone thinking Super Pro's identity is secret, despite his helmet having a transparent visor on it that anyone can see him through. Kickers may have secret identities, but they're not even trying to hide them. Just the fact that they may be slowly developing superpower while their leader definitely has them as well as turning his hair white. Little known fact, white hair equals super strength. Go dye your hair white and find out for yourselves. Number two, Amazing Cow Heroes. Do I need to say anything else? Is there anything I could add to cows that become superheroes? And not even like anthropomorphic cows or just someone who's milk themed or something. No, no. Legitimate farm cows who gain superpowers and then inexplicably get costumes. And it's sad when the other two options are less silly than this. The Amazing Cow Heroes, a promotional comics for Chick-fil-A, posit that one should eat more chicken instead of beef. A message I can get behind since I love chicken. I just don't get it from them. And told through by way of superhero cows. We've only reviewed two of them so far, a speed steer and cold cuts, but I do want to return to them some more in the future because, well, it speaks for itself, doesn't it? So is Secret Agent Poyo from Chu supposed to be, like, the dark side to the amazing cow heroes? Because my money is on the killer cyborg chicken. <laughs> And the number one goofiest and weirdest superhero on a top the fourth wall is... AAU Superstar! Back in 2020, I did two comic book quickies to try to get to episode 600 before a theme month. And boy howdy did it have a hell of an advertisement for us! Everything about AAU Superstar is amazingly ridiculous. He's apparently in the far future because we see him at a disco on Saturn. His entire identity, and possibly power set, is based on sneakers. His costume has his name on it as if to say, yes, seriously, that's what I'm calling myself. And apparently a foe he has fought more than once is a different shoe-themed character called Dirty Sneaker, whose own shoes are not literally dirty, but rather contain a disco death ray, which is activated upon hearing the Bee Gees staying alive. Superstar himself has supernatural powers, which I guess means like shoe based clairvoyance, because it detects the death ray and he proceeds to kick dirty sneakers into orbit of Saturn. This isn't even the only appearance of AAU Superstar. He was not limited to a one-off ad. This guy is legitimately a recurring marketing character despite all of that. I've thought before that I could probably put together some kind of shoe-based Justice League from all the characters who show up in ad comics based on shoes like the Dingo Kid and Johnny West. But AAU Superstar easily leads this team, but with the legit superpowers and costume. He is a superhero above all others, and definitely the weirdest, goofiest, and most ridiculous superhero we have ever seen on a top the fourth wall. And that's it for 2022. When we return next year, we'll hopefully get things off to a good start, because we're going to be doing something silly and beloved as we look at the original Marvel Comics adaptation of Star Wars A New Hope. And hopefully, we can really say by the next December that 2023 is a great year.
Why does this thing have two triggers on it? Hello my friends, please be sure to like this video, subscribe, hit the bell, and share it with others. And if you get a chance, maybe check out my Patreon.